Hello and welcome to the program. My special guest today is Robert Alvarez, a senior scholar at the Institute for Policy Studies, where he's currently focused on nuclear disarmament, environmental and energy policies. Between 1993 and 1999, Mr. Alvarez served as a senior policy advisor to the Secretary and Deputy Assistant Secretary for National Security and the Environment. While at the Department of Energy, he coordinated the effort to enact nuclear worker compensation legislation. He coordinated nuclear material strategic planning for the department and established the department's first asset management program. Bob was awarded two secretarial gold medals, the highest awards given by the department. Bob Alvarez is an award-winning author and has published articles in prominent publications such as Science Magazine, The Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, Technology Review and The Washington Post. He joins me now from America. Welcome to If You Love This Planet, Bob. Good morning. Good morning. Good afternoon to you. We're taping That's right. in Australia <laughs> and you're in Washington, D.C. Now, That's right. Um, the reason I wanted to specifically interview you now is to go through uh, in a logical sequence and explain to the public your paper on spent fuel storage. And we'll have to start right from the beginning. Um, what is spent fuel? Spent fuel uh, is, are the, the, the rods that are used in nuclear power plants to generate heat, uh, and the heat is generated by splitting the atoms of uh, uranium-235, uh, which is uh, in a uh, 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 mixture with uranium-238 in a percentage of around 3, 4, maybe 5 percent these days. And uh, after a period of a uh, year and a half or so, uh, the uh, uh, the fuel builds up radioactivity, and the ability of the uh, of the atoms of uranium-235 to split diminishes, and the fuel is is spent. The uranium-235 is spent, and in the course of doing that, it has uh, uh, generated a fantastic amount of radiation. These fuel rods are uh, about oh, I would say roughly six to maybe seven, eight feet long. They're about as thick as uh, perhaps your thumb. And they are encased in a metal tube uh, uh, cladding that's made of, a, of, of a, uh, uh, an alloy of zirconium and stainless steel. Uh, these rods are then placed in the bundles, and the bundles tend to be in bunches of, let's say, 80 to 100. And uh, when they are, the fuel is used up, they pull these bundles out, and they place them in uh, pools of water that are located near the reactor, uh, where they're supposed to be cooled off. Uh, and the original intention was for the the spent fuel to be put into these pools. And after five years, when uh, uh, some of the the more radioactive elements would have decayed and becomes uh, less hot both radioactively and thermally, uh, the spent fuel was to be moved elsewhere. Uh, but that has not been the case in the United States. These spent fuel rods, uh, in a typical spent fuel pool, uh, constitute some of the largest concentrations of radioactivity in the planet. Uh, some the reactors in the United States have been operating for several decades uh, and are, have uh, two or three reactors at a site that have been operating for 30 or 40 years. And these reactors have generated uh, literally uh, uh, several hundred uh, millions of curies of radioactivity. There, there, aren't, uh, there aren't any concentrations like that that... Uh, that uh, exist other than at, uh, at uh, long, long operating nuclear power plants. Yeah, um, I, I've read that in America where, as you've just pointed out, the reactors have been going some for 40 years, that in some of the spent fuel pools, um, there's two to 
30 times more radiation in the spent fuel pools than there is in the reactor itself. Would that be accurate? That's correct. And it has uh, a much more long-lived radioactivity than would be in a reactor. Uh, you would uh, typically, a spent fuel pool would have uh, roughly five, six, seven times more long-lived radioactivity, most notably cesium-137, than you would have in a reactor. Yeah. Um, so just to give a background, when you put 100 tons or so of uranium in a reactor core, which is usually about the amount they use, the uranium, when it fissions, becomes 1 billion times more radioactive. 1 billion times more radioactive. And the core itself contains as much long-lived radiation as that released by the explosion of a 1,000 Hiroshima-sized bombs. So it's very, very radioactive. Describe just one spent fuel rod, which is about half an inch wide, and, you know, 6 to 12 feet long, Bob, if you stand next to it, what would happen to you as a human being? Well, if you were to stand next to it for any period of time, uh, you know, a minute or so, you would uh, die from acute radiation syndrome. Well, how, how much time would you need to stand next to it for before you got that? Minutes. Minutes. If that. I so mean, much for, gamma for, radiation like x -rays. Yeah, if you, would, if you would take a uh, bundle of rods, for yeah. example, and and put them outside, which is really inconceivable. But uh, And you were to uh, ride on a motorcycle and drive uh, uh, within one foot of those rods at 60 miles per hour, uh, the, the time that you would, you would spend passing by at one foot at 60 miles an hour be, would be enough to uh, kill you outright immediately. What, you just dropped dead off the motorbike? Yep. Oh, my God, I didn't know that. That's how, I mean, that's how fantastically radioactive this material is. You know, that is. would make a good film. Someone should make a film about all of this. Uh, well. <laughs> Do you know anyone in Hollywood? Uh, yes, with, <laughs> with special effects in the studios. Uh, well, I mean, I mean this is realistic. That, I mean, it is, it, it, it is, this stuff is phenomenally radioactive, oh. and it has to be. And so it has, this is why it has to be kept in heavily shielded environments, uh, and uh, they're, they're stored in the United States. Most of the spent fuel, about 75% of it that's been generated over these decades, are stored in these pools that are holding about four to five times more spent fuel than their original designs intended. These pools were never intended to be indefinite storage facilities for this ever-accumulating amount of uh, radioactive material. And where are the pools located um, in regards to the reactor itself? Well, for the uh, reactors that are similar to that of the, of the Fukushima reactors, which you know, experienced this terrible uh, disaster, uh, there are general electric boiling water Mark I uh, reactors. Uh, the General Electric Boiling Water Mark I and Mark II reactors have pools that are next to the reactors and are about 100 feet off the ground. They're next so, to them. I thought they were on top of them, on top of the building. That no, they're off, the they're, off the, they're off to the side. Oh, to the and side. In a separate building? Uh, no, they're, they're in the, basically in the same reactor yeah. building. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but in order to refuel a boiling water reactor, you sort of have to pop off the top, pull the fuel out, and shift it over by an overhead crane, crane. into the nearby pool. Yeah, so, uh, so, so they're sort of on the roof. What, what, what about other pools? Are some of them on well, the ground? Well, the pressurized water reactors are either are located nearby the reactors, but they tend to be either... Uh, uh, on grade or slightly below grade, but they have cavities beneath them, uh, large uh, spaces beneath them, which is problematic. The reason I'm mentioning the problem of the height of the pools and the issue of the cavities is that uh, it is the concern of what might happen if water were to drain. And uh, Well, first of all, explain why water is necessary. Water is necessary to provide both cooling and shielding. 
So, uh, so these cool, these spent fuel pools need to be continually cooled, as does the reactor core itself, right? With that's water. right. They have to they have to have water circulating through them on a constant basis. Yeah. Uh, they don't they don't get as hot as fast as the uh, uh, material inside of a reactor does, but over time, um, if you lose the coolant, uh, you'll, some very, very uh, uh, bad things can happen. In 2003, uh, my colleagues and I wrote a paper uh, because of our concern over the 9-11 the attacks, and uh, we looked at what might happen if uh, terrorists were to uh, use the nuclear power plant as a target and what would be the most vulnerable aspect of the reactor. And we, we decided it was the spent fuel pools because the pools, unlike the reactors themselves, are not under any heavy, uh, thick-walled uh, you know, concrete containment. Uh, they tend to be housed in what they call the reactor building and are housed in structures that you would find at auto dealerships or big box stores. So, uh, and then the pools that are high up above ground, if you think about it, if something were to cause a crack in the pool uh, and the water would drain all that much faster. Do you think terrorists uh, are aware of the vulnerability of these pools, Bob Alvarez? I think so. I think so. I mean, I, I think that... Uh, uh, that uh, there's enough information out in the public record that uh, this is not uh, some some big secret I'm giving away. And, uh, and is, is, isn't it true that the terrorists who flew into the World Trade Towers had in fact targeted the two Indian Point nuclear power plants 35 miles from Manhattan? Is that so? They had certainly considered doing that, and uh, uh, but chose not to. Uh, and and do those the, reactors have cooling pools on the on the uh, on the roof of the building? Elevated? No, they don't. They don't have elevated pools. But wh what we pointed out was that um, if something or somebody, because uh, uh, things, the, one of the worst possible things could happen to a, a reactor is, for example, an earthquake. Yeah. Uh, because it it. it it causes, you know, essentially uh, destruction of, of lots of things that are necessary uh, to, to keep uh, the reactor uh, in a safe mode. And so if someone were to crash a plane or an earthquake were to occur and cause the, the water to drain from the pool, what would happen is that over time, the by the time the water, these, these pools are 40 to 50 feet deep. The walls are fairly thick, uh, but they can be penetrated by uh, anti-tank weapons, aircraft, and things like that, uh, or earthquakes can cause them to crack. Mm. Um, when the water drains, uh, by the time the water reaches approximately, let's say, one meter above the top of the spent fuel, the radiation doses coming off of the the spent fuel assemblies uh, would be life-threatening to people at the site. Isn't that uh, what happened in Fukushima? Well, uh, that's, that's that certainly what happened at Fukushima. Uh, in and four they, fuel pools? Four fuel pools? Well, they had, they had pools where, where they are obviously, the dose rates that were coming off of the pools were so great that they couldn't go near these, these buildings and had to use remote water cannons and uh, helicopters and the like to try to dump water and then to keep them from... And, uh, and uh, isn't that still the case? They haven't really fixed the fuel pools and they're still emanating... Well, what they have huge... done is that they've been able to establish a little more stable supply of water, but it's not a closed system. It's still an ad hoc system uh, and subject to lots of leaks. And the things such as the pools themselves uh, you have to be concerned about their integrity after the earthquake and the tsunami and whether or not they have cracks in them or any other disturbances can cause mm. them to, to leak further. Mm. So as, we, as the water drains, and by, by the time the water uh, uh, is drained enough that the, 
the, the fuel itself is exposed to open air, uh, it varies in time, but it could be a matter of hours that uh, the, 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 the tubing around this, this, this used fuel or spent fuel, uh, the zirconium cladding, will start to heat up, and it starts to oxidize, uh, rust, uh, in other words, and uh, it generates hydrogen. Uh, it, 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 it separates the, uh, the hydrogen from the oxygen in water and starts generating hydrogen. And then after it reaches about 800 degrees centigrade because of the enormous heat emanating from, this, uh, from the radioactive material inside these tubes, the, the cladding, the tubing itself, will spontaneously ignite like giant Roman candles. Mm -hmm. And you'll have essentially a catastrophic fire. Uh, a colleague of mine referred to a a pool fire as uh, Chernobyl on steroids. And isn't that what uh, happened at Unit Four or Unit Three in Fukushima? Well, it, it, what has happened? These these it's like there there is certainly some evidence that it happened at Unit Four and Unit Three. Uh, the what is what has caused the, those huge explosions in the areas of the pools have, have not been fully explained, uh -huh. uh, and they are now sort of we're still still operating in the realm of of uh, what uh, TEPCO is willing to share with the public, or the Japanese government is willing to share with the public. Certainly, right during the course of the accident, our Nuclear Regulatory Commission had concluded that the pool at, at Unit 4 had experienced an explosion because yes. uh, the fuel had been exposed. Hydrogen explosion. They, al they also found evidence of, of uh, fragments of fuel uh, that were blown away uh, as far as a mile or so from the reactor. With plutonium in them? Well, yes. Uh, well, they had plutonium in them, but I think the, the, the real bad actor in, in a uh, spent fuel uh, uh, fire uh, is cesium-137. Uh, and the reason is that it, it, do it tends to dominate the long-lived radioactive materials that are present. Describe uh, cesium. Tell the people what cesium-137 is, Bob, and, what, and, and its radioactive um, properties and its biological properties. Certainly. Uh, cesium-137 uh, it, it has a half-life of, of 30 years. So the rule of thumb is that it takes approximately 10 half-lives for it to decay to down to levels that are presumed to, to not be harmful to people. So it can, be, it can remain dangerous for centuries. Uh, as it decays, it gives off uh, a form of external penetrating radiation like x-rays called gamma rays. So if there is a substantial amount of radioactive cesium that's deposited on the ground, you can get your whole body irradiated from these gamma rays. Then over time, uh, cesium mimics potassium and will therefore accumulate in the food chain and will accumulate in all things uh, that, that people consume as food, whether they be uh, vegetables or, or animal products as if it were potassium. And so then that, that potassium or a radioactive cesium, once it enters your body, is essentially incorporated throughout your body. And so you're getting uh, internal exposure to your whole body from radioactive cesium. Cesium-137 uh, is the primary reason why they have the exclusionary zone around Chernobyl. Uh, that's approximately uh, uh, a, a thousand square meters, square uh, meters. roughly uh, uh, square kilometers. That's right, correct. Square kilometers. Yes. Square kilometers, and uh, for us in the United States, it's uh, about the size of half of one of our states, New Jersey. Um, so, and that area has has been been off limits now for. Uh, uh, some 25, 26 years. <clears throat> um, 
and would probably remain so for perhaps hundreds of years. Um, so what's happening? We, we, we pointed out in our study that if there were such a fire at a U.S. reactor that contained uh, uh, this, this amount of cesium, these reactors can contain as much as uh, uh, 35 million curies of radioactive cesium in them. If, they, if, that, if um, a fraction of, of that uh, material were to be released in a fire and, and get out through the smoke and deposit on the nearby land, it could render an area uninhabitable much greater than that created by the Chernobyl accident. Of a thousand square kilometers. Right. We pointed out that it could be, depending on how much radioactive cesium would get out, it could be as much as 60 times greater than the uh, uh, than the exclusionary zone at well, uh, Chernobyl. Well, so, so to give people an idea of what that means, what the size of the state of what? Which it state? would be the size of several states. It several would be states. New, New Jersey, uh, Rhode Island, New England, uh, a good part of New England uh, would be rendered uninhabitable. New York, Massachusetts, uh, uh, would be rendered uninhabitable. So, all right, let's go from from America. If I can just if I can just finish the story a yes, little bit. Yes, sorry, further. sorry. This study provoked quite a hue and cry by the nuclear industry of the United States, and we were, uh, uh, let's say, stricken off of a lot of Christmas card lists. <laughs> for this. And but it it provoked such controversy that the United States Congress asked the National Academy of Sciences to sort this out. And in 2004, the Academy released a report which essentially confirmed our findings. So then what happened? Uh, uh, it, it was uh, essentially ignored by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. How dare about, they? What, what, are these characters, what do these characters think they're doing? I mean, the more I look at the nuclear industry, the more I realize what a horrific crime horrific crime it is um, it is putting upon the people of the world particularly in Japan um, I spoke to a man yesterday who is trying to bring a lawsuit against the Japanese government for incinerating sewage and radioactive waste um, by incinerating it all you do is you push it up into the air and then disperse it all over the country. And there's a huge cover-up going on in Japan at the moment, Bob. Um, and I, it almost takes, well, it does take my breath away. I, 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 it's a crime beyond anything I've really ever, ever known. What well, would you say to that statement? I, I'd say that in our country, uh, we do we don't have real regulation of nuclear safety. Uh, we have an agency that's more of an enabler. Well, why is uh, why is that? Why is that? Well, I, I think that well, in recent years, it has a lot to do with the changing political landscape in the United States. Uh, by the late 1980s, 1990s rather. Uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission had in place, and some can argue that it wasn't good enough, but it was it was it was it was, it was there, and it would prove to be somewhat adequate. Had a, a much more of an arm's length relationship with the industry it's supposed to regulate. And uh, in the 1990s, a whistleblower at a uh, reactor in Connecticut, the Millstone One reactor. Uh, who was an employee there, became very concerned about the shortcuts that were being taken by the operators of this reactor, especially how they were handling spent fuel in particular. Eventually, uh, this whistleblower made the, the, the cover of Time magazine, and it so embarrassed the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that they had to go in and they did what I would describe as a wire brush inspection and found a host of problems and ordered the reactor to be closed until the problems could be uh, corrected. The owner of the reactor essentially decided that it wasn't worth the money and shut it down. This provoked a huge amount of anger and outcry in the Republicans who were controlling the, the Congress at the time and 
they threatened to cut 700 positions from the NRC's the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's Enforcement Division uh, and more or less forced the NRC to move away from its position of being a regulator to being an enabler and made it much more dependent on industry self-reporting of problems. Oh, uh, with, so it was the Republicans, with, really, yeah. who have yeah. little, if any, scientific background or knowledge. Well, if you read the, the autobiography of Senator Peter Domenici, he was oh. a Republican senator from New, from New Mexico, he proudly, in, in, there's, a, there's this passage in his autobiography where he proudly notes that he did this. Uh, he was outraged that uh, somebody concerned about safety would dare shut down a reactor that would, was losing, causing a company to lose money. And he promised that this would never happen again, and he was in such a position of authority that he uh, threatened to essentially gut the entire NRC's enforcement program. I wonder if he's ever seen anyone die of cancer, who he loves. I don't know. I don't know anything about his personal life. Uh, it just uh, so, takes my breath away but, as a doctor. These characters are so evil, and I, I, mean, I mean that word. I mean that word as a doctor, evil, because... What is happening now in Japan is so horrendous and there's a huge cover-up by TEPCO and the Japanese government and the American government, may I say, and the media in Japan and America and there are going to be hundreds of thousands if not millions of deaths from cancer from what's happening in Fukushima, let alone what may happen, as you are describing, Bob Alvarez, in America at certain reactors as we proceed. I, I can't. I can't think of any other word to describe this. Well, it's going to be. It, this this accident is continuing to unfold in terms of its consequences, and I, I'm not sure, given the severity of this accident, that that the uh, the efforts to try to downplay its dangers, deny its existence, make it victims as invisible as possible, blame the victim is another thing they do. Mm -hmm. I, don't, not necessarily, I don't necessarily think that those tactics are going to prevail in a situation that's so severe as this. Well, but uh, that, there's no evidence really. I mean, the average Joe Blow in the street, or Mrs. Joe Blow, hasn't a clue what's going on in Japan. And I would, I've just been in America for an intense four-week lecture tour. People have no idea. In Australia, we the uranium in those reactors is probably Australian uranium. No one knows. And I just spoke to a very highly qualified person in Japan yesterday, and he said there's a huge cover-up there too. So, in fact, I do not understand how the ramifications could be so severe if no one knows what's going on and there's a huge cover-up. Well, I think, I think the kinds of things that are going on that don't get re reported much at all mm. is is the fact is that many of the foods grown in Japan are no are no longer being allowed in to other countries. Yeah, uh, this is having a serious impact. Uh, the rice harvest of Japan is now being jeopardized. Yes, and rice is, is a, not only a, a huge staple for the diet; it has it has very great cultural importance to the Japanese. Um, there, they are now reporting areas of contamination in greater metropolitan Tokyo that are comparable to <clears throat> what is being found in the in the exclusionary zone at uh, Chernobyl. I mean, these are unprecedented problems. I mean, there, there isn't anything that, that, that compares to the, the challenge posed by protecting people from the aftermath of this accident. At Chernobyl, they were able to evacuate permanently around 200,000 people, and one of the things they were, one of the reasons they were able to do that with some success, is that was was the low population density. They, around Chernobyl, they had an average population density of approximately 10 people per square kilometer. Mm. In a place like Greater Metropolitan Tokyo, your population density is around six to seven thousand people per square kilometer. Mm. Uh, where are these people to go? Thirty million people live in Tokyo. Thirty million people live in Tokyo. 
two million people live in the Fukushima prefecture where half the rice in Japan is grown and the rice is now just starting to be harvested and it's full of cesium-137, which is the... I mean, I think this is something going to require a good faith effort on an international level to come to terms with. But isn't the uh, International Atomic Energy Agency participating in the cover-up? Uh, I kind of looked at them during the accident as the equivalent of the nuclear version of Fox News. In oh, the country. oh, Bob! Uh, in oh terms of you know, because they kept they kept issuing all these press statements as the, these reactors were blowing up, saying everything's fine, so they have it under control now, and then then there'd be another explosion, uh, and then you would see the footage of the explosion. I think one of the most dramatic uh, things that sort of turned, you know, made it no longer much of an abstraction for me was to see the satellite photos after the explosion in Unit 3 and to see the spent fuel pool exposed to the open sky and billowing out steam and knowing that uh, that pool was damaged and was was full of, uh, you know, enormous amounts of radioactivity was probably escaping. Plus plutonium. Plus the plutonium. Plus the plutonium. I mean, I, I am concerned about plutonium, but I am much more concerned about the cesium because there's so much more of it, and it volatilizes more easily. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, uh, and, 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 and really is, the, I think, the, the, the reference contaminant that, that is, defines uh, habitability, quite frankly, whether well, you what do you, what, to what, what is live that? there or not. Um, I'm interviewing Bob Alvarez, who was a senior policy advisor to the Secretary and Deputy Assistant Secretary for National Security and the Environment, and he is a senior scholar at the Institute for Policy Studies. Bob Alvarez, describe what is actually happening now at Fukushima, right now as we speak. Well, as best I can piece together, I mean, a lot of the information is still fragmentary and only being provided on a limited basis by the government and the uh, and the owner of the reactors. But what I have been able to ascertain is that they 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 are not out of the woods. Uh, they are not have yet to uh, achieve the goal of establishing what you call a closed loop cooling system to make sure that the the contents of the reactors and the spent fuel pools, which are still very radioactive and potentially very dangerous if uh, they lose their water supplies, uh, are, uh, are, are being supplied with a, a regular supply of water, but also water from a system that's not leaking like a sieve. And it is uh, leaking not, like a sieve. And, and, got, it is. and there are three masses of molten uranium called corium that have hit their containment vessels in units one, two, and three, and they say, I mean, how are they going to how are they going to get rid of that? How are they going to remove it? Well, all I can say is that in in the United States, when we had the Three Mile Island accident, which was uh, nowhere near as severe as that which has taken place in Fukushima, yeah, is that it took 20 years to remove the contents years. of the core. Yeah, only one third of it melted. So twenty years. <laughs> it took um, twenty years to remove the contents of the reactor core. The, and there are estimates now that the Fukushima situation is two to five times worse than Chernobyl, and we know from the Na New York Academy of Sciences report that maybe a million people have already died in the first twenty-five years after Chernobyl. So you can multiply a million by you know two to five, huh? Could you? Would, would that you could. Be? You could. I mean, in terms of cleaning up the mess at uh, Fukushima, uh, and compared to Chernobyl, I mean, there's there's no dispute uh, that the mess at Chernobyl is so radioactive right now that it will take at least another 100 years before they could get around to do, to doing anything with that mess at Chernobyl. Uh, yeah. When you think about 100 year time frame. Uh, you know, um, what was Australia like 100 years ago? Um, pretty primitive. What will it be like 100 years from now? Uh, you know, these these are these are not insignificant time frames. So, uh, I I'm of the opinion right now that the 
the spent fuel and especially the molten fuel from the reactors at, at Fukushima are going to be there for a very long time with no, no, no place to go. Well, uh, also, and yeah, go on. So, and I think the major concern has got to be to to do everything possible to keep any further radioactivity from escaping. Yeah, but you know, I am using this figure, and 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 apparently it's accurate that every day, twelve thousand trillion becquerels of radiation are escaping into the air every day. Have you heard that number? Uh, I've seen the numbers. I just don't remember 12, all these numbers. 12,000 billion the trillion becquerels. 12, and becqu yeah, 12,000 trillion becquerels. A becquerel is a disintegration per second. Right, right. So therefore, huge... And, and then I read a report today, um, I don't know, in the New York Times or something, that says, oh, the radiation is where it's decreasing, the amount that's being emitted. I The lies are just flabbergasting. I mean, if I lied in medicine, I'd be killing my patients. And that's what's happening. They're killing people by lying. And the awful thing is that the Japanese government knew pretty early, because they had monitors, where the plume of intense radioactive material was going, but they didn't tell the people so the people could flee because they didn't I mean, want to I create panic. There is this mindset, which I think is a... Um a cultural mindset that is, has its origins, quite frankly, in the U.S. nuclear weapons program. Yeah, the weapons that's program. Wa that's washed over, watch, washed over into the commercial nuclear industry, yeah. which is um, that it, the worst possible thing you can do is to scare the public and that their fear is worse than telling them the truth. That's unbelievable. And, unbelievable. and so... It's that logic, and when you have a system of where people are operating and are encouraged to operate it uh, by their government in isolation and secrecy and privilege, where they only talk to themselves and uh, believe uh, be begin to believe that the, that the public is more of an enemy than an ally. Uh, you know, the, there's this attitude that that, he, that that quickly emerges, which is what they don't know can't hurt us. What they don't and, know can't hurt us. That's amazing. And this is a, an, a sort of a cultural ethos that was uh, uh, very well refined by our nuclear weapons program by the, by the 1950s. Uh, this is why so many nuclear weapons were exploded in the open air in the continental United States and the Pacific and elsewhere, uh, because uh, and and there, there the other the other sort of uh, logic that, that I've seen is this logic of what you call the greater good, uh, which is uh, well, yes, we have to sacrifice people, but. There's a greater good involved here, and in the case of nuclear weapons, for example, the greater good was to deter uh, the Soviet Union uh, and those kinds of things. So in the meantime, you know, we wound up uh, putting our own people in harm's way without their knowledge and consent, the, our, and our government w was doing this with impunity. And this has all come out. I mean, I'm not revealing anything that... Uh, is uh, a new revelation. This is sort of what's come out in the last 20 or so years. But we're dealing with a culture. Uh, I call it, it's been called the cult of the atom. Uh, we're dealing with a culture, a mindset that has largely been cultivated by government uh, that encourages isolation, secrecy, uh, misleading of the public, uh, rationalizations that could never hold up to scrutiny of, of a democratic society to carry out an agenda on the behalf of a bureaucracy and a technology which is uh, now proving to be catastrophic and ultra-harmful to the world. As you talk, uh, I think to myself that the work we did in the 80s as physicians for social responsibility, we translated 
the arcane nuclear language that you've just been describing uh, that has, was engendered by the nuclear physicists and the government into lay language to describe what nuclear weapons actually mean to people when they get exploded over cities and a nuclear war, that must have freaked them out of their heads, do you think? I think so. And, I mean, there's some humorous things, too. I mean, there is dark humor, but, you know, uh, I recall going to congressional hearings here in the United States and listening to witnesses from the uh, government nuclear program describing uh, events such as uh, rapid energetic disassemblies. Yep. What does that mean? Explosion. Rapid energetic disassemblies. Mm-hmm. I know, and when people get killed in nuclear war, the people are disassembled, disassembled. Or, or uh, they use these uh, uh, terms, health effects. Health um, effects? Yeah, health effects. Like what? Uh, dying of cancer. Health effects. I mean, that's, you know, they, I mean, it's, it's the, the, all the, the, the terminology has been so, so, so neutralized and, and made so uh, bland and that uh, people don't realize what this means. Uh, so we have a terrible history in this country, which we're still trying to come to terms with, uh, uh, where our government deliberately misled the public about the dangers of radioactive fallout from bomb testing. I wonder and how many people deliberately, deliberately misled the public. About you know, it. Uh, America exploded more than a thousand bombs above ground uh, in the desert, in Nevada, and elsewhere, and absolutely doused America with radioactive fallout. And the incidence of cancer continues to rise now. And when you think that the incubation time for cancer is any time from five to eighty years, almost certainly the increase in cancer partly is caused by that fallout. And the National Cancer Institute only estimated thyroid cancers, I think 115,000 from radioactive iodine fallout, but it's never estimated the number of cancers caused by the fallout from strontium-90, cesium-137, plutonium-239, americium, and all the rest of the fallout that occurred. Would you like to comment on that, Bob Alvarez? Well, I mean, in fairness, to the National Cancer Institute, they were asked by Congress to only look at iodine-131. Why? Uh, I, I cannot explain that, but let me sort of finish the story here. And they were asked in the early 1990s to do, or in the early 1980s to do this, mainly because of concern of fallout from uh, weapons testing in Nevada. And they were asked to look at hotspots of iodine-131 from weapons testing in Nevada in the continental United States. How much was released? Where did it go? Mm -hmm. How much got absorbed into the food chain? What kinds of exposures did people receive of different uh, ages and genders? And then what, 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 uh, what happened to these people in terms of estimated cancers? Yep. Uh, what happened was that uh, the National Cancer Institute to suppress the study for five years. And I had found out about it while working in the Energy Department in 1997 uh, from a reporter who the, the, our, our news media was on to it and was trying to find out more about it. So I was in a, a position of some authority to, uh, to summon the National Cancer Institute experts to brief me about this study. Yeah. And they gave me a briefing, and it, and it was uh, essentially a, a series of color-coded maps of the United States that mm. sort of indicated uh, how much was released, where did it go, what the concentrations were in in uh, grass and vegetation and in milk, and how, what the doses were to various people uh, of different ages and genders. And uh, as I was flipping through this thing, I you know I kind of know knew what the numbers meant, and it was, uh, I, the first thing that caught my attention was that the, the contamination of the milk was so large in certain regions, especially the upper Midwest, where a great deal of our, at that time, a great deal of our, our, uh, our milk supply was being produced, uh. Uh, that it had, had we had, 
the what we call protective action guides that we have in place today to deal with nuclear accidents, which did not exist then. Uh, the milk the milk production for entire regions of the country would have had to be removed from human consumption and for it, periods of months on end. But it wasn't. So it wasn't. It wasn't. And not only that, oh, no. what 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 caught my attention finally was when I looked down at the bottom of the page of the briefing document. Here I am in June of 1997, and at the bottom of the page it says September 1992. So I asked, I said, what is this all about here? You you're, you finished your analysis some five years ago, yeah. uh, and why aren't you uh, making this public? And they hemmed and hawed, and finally someone said, well, we were waiting for the Chernobyl findings to come in on thyroid cancers. And so um, what I did is that I, since I was working for the Secretary of Energy, I wrote a memorandum to the Secretary and basically I urged that, that we, this, this document be released immediately and that um, there was no need to, to sort of wait for, uh, for people to drop dead from Chernobyl, that you could do some reasonable estimates. And I estimated at that time that the median estimate of thyroid cancers, there would be at least 75,000 excess thyroid cancers. From where? Uh, yeah. And, where? and for from my where? Trouble, from Chernobyl? From, no, no, just from oh. the fallout from okay. the Nevada system. Yeah, yeah. So um, it finally came out. Uh, the head of the National Cancer Institute had to admit before a congressional invest, uh, hearing that indeed they had suppressed the study. The people who had conducted the study had transferred over from the U.S. nuclear weapons program before that to do it, uh, which gives you an idea yeah. of sort of the reach of, of this industry in our in our society here in the United States. And the principal investigator, of course, was demoted, and you know people left, and that was the end of that. But uh, it indicated to me just what a fundamental conflict of interest we have in, in, with governments that have made such huge investments in nuclear technology that they, they, they have created a system uh, that, where the, the, the people who are, who are responsible for putting people in harm's way are responsible for, uh, uh, for explaining why they did it and what, what might have happened. And that creates in, in, in immediate conflicts of interest and corruption of science and medicine and all the things that are important to a healthy society. I'm interviewing Bob Alvarez, who served as a senior policy advisor to the Secretary and Deputy Assistant Secretary for National Security and the Environment. So, Bob, OK, here's the next question. I'm a physician. And I guess, in a certain sense, in my mind, I represent my colleagues and my profession. We're the ones that deal with people who walk in with a lump in their neck uh, and we diagnose thyroid cancer and we have to take it out and excise the whole thyroid and you know, help the patients to die. And I've helped patients to die of thyroid cancer and it's a hideous, horrible death. I remember one woman, aged 28, who was my patient when I was actually an intern, aged 20 three at the Royal Adelaide Hospital and she came in with thyroid cancer. It had disseminated to a degree in her body. She was a ballet dancer and she gradually died uh, as the secondaries got into her brain. She became incontinent of urine and feces and started to lose her equilibrium mentally and the like and it was the most debilitating, horrific, painful death and almost certainly we postulate that that thyroid cancer was caused by radioactive iodine released from the British tests at Maralinga, um, north of Adelaide. Um, and what happened was they blew a, up a huge bomb and the wind changed and they didn't expect that to happen. And Adelaide was absolutely dust in radioactive fallout. So my question to you, Bob, is, and you may not be able to answer it, why is not the medical profession Of attacking this, uh, what can I say, revolting industry which is killing people? Well, I think 
I think the practice of medicine, at least in the United States, has become so compartmentalized that uh, you know if you you even go to a radiologist who knows about radiation, um, they they can't give you any straight answers about well what kind of dose might I receive yes, that's if I take true. This procedure and why aren't you recording this in my chart? Well, yeah. not, they don't have to. Um, there, and that I think medicine has become, as I said, has become so fragmented and and uh, uh, so highly specialized that people sort of, when when this happens, when you have this kind of specialization, uh, I think what happens is that the the, the 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 knowledge of the bigger picture of what might be happening to the society as a whole and what and the role of physicians in dealing with that tends to get lost in the shuffle. And no one takes and responsibility. We, but you... And we have to and, we, and then we have to depend on on people and I, there's no problem I have no problem with this, but we have to really depend more and more on on doctors and professionals who look at large populations as if they were patients. Mm. And these are people that are commonly known as epidemiologists. Mm. Uh, and the problem is that uh, our tools to measure a lot of these these effects are not uh, are not uh, accurate enough and sharp enough to pick up a lot of things that we should. And the science itself, I mean, in the United States, until well into the um, the 1990s, the the new U.S. nuclear weapons con program had monopoly control over all radiation health effects research because they considered uh, the loss of that control to be a threat to the national security of the United States. Is that so? And and did that influence the World Health Organization as well? I don't know if it's influenced the World Health Organization, but it certainly influenced how the United States did its own research. I had through no the idea. National Cancer Institute and elsewhere. I had no and it was idea through, about that. So uh, this this sort of uh, this is a form of corruption of science and medicine when you when you allow this to happen. But you know, at the end of World War II, nuclear weapons were held with such awe and fear, and and were considered uh, so essential to. Uh, preserving the national security or protecting the national security that uh, things like uh, revealing the, revealing information that clearly indicated that you were putting workers in harm's way or the public in harm's way were considered national security threats. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I, I recall... Go on. I recall in, 19, in the 1980s, uh, during the first mm -hmm. Reagan administration, the... Uh, uh, the general counsel, uh, the chief lawyer of the Defense Department, sending a letter to Congress de declaring that providing compensation to military personnel who may have been made ill from exposure to radiation during open air testing was a threat to our national security. Oh my God! Well, just that was the, that's, it's just it's a mindset, and that that washes over into uh, uh, in, into the uh, into the way. Doctors are are uh, are educated, and science and, and the scientific agendas in terms of public health well, are determined. Yeah, I would disagree with that. I've just done grand rounds um, at a major Johns Hopkins hospital in uh, in uh, St. Pete in Florida, and at the General Hospital in Tampa. And certainly, doctors don't have that attitude. But on the other hand, we are not taught in medical school about the effects of radiation and the isotopes produced in reactors and from bomb explosions and the like. In other words, we're pretty uneducated. But I will say right now, the American uh, Medical Association has just released a paper saying that we must all be concerned about radiological accidents. And I guess that was um, stimulated by the Fukushima accident. It's really quite in-depth. And there's another paper that's just come out too about a 10 kiloton bomb dropping on a city and what that would mean medically speaking to people and how we could cope well, with that as a medical This profession. is encouraging. I mean, this is encouraging, but I think this is, 
this is an example of what it means to end the Cold War and for the status of nuclear weapons to steady, de steadily decline in this country. Mm. Is that we have, we do have a more opening up uh, and a broader understanding by people who, who uh, whose responsibility it is, is to yeah, but uh, a, is to keep us healthy and to protect our, oh, our, it's a bit our late. health. It's a bit late, and when I look at the intricacies uh, involved in the nuclear power program, which is backed by the weapons program still in America, as you've so aptly described today, Bob Alvarez, and in Japan, it takes my breath away, and I just I, 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 I'm almost beyond trying to understand what these characters think they're up to. Um, I think that what's happening in Japan is one of the greatest evils imposed upon a, a, an unsuspecting, innocent society who in the past has suffered from the effects of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's just almost beyond belief. And the fact that the media is totally not attending to it um, is is something that must be taken on by all of us. You know, Bob, we've run out of time, and I'm terribly sorry. I've just been soliloquizing a bit, but um, you are a font of most extraordinary information, and the more you talk, the more fascinating it becomes because of your experience in the Department of Energy, um, which you once called the Department of Evil, to be actually... <laughs> Evil and entropy. Evil and <laughs> entropy. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much, Bob. You're a you're a national treasure, if not an international treasure. Well, thank you. Bye, Bob. My guest today on If You Love This Planet was Robert Alvarez, a senior scholar at the Institute for Policy Studies, where he is currently focused on nuclear disarmament, environmental, and energy policies. Thanks for listening today. You can go to our website at ifyoulovethisplanet.org to hear more programs and also to contribute to our funding if you would like to do so, which would help us enormously to continue doing this very important work. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back with you next week with another very interesting program. I can promise you that. Bye for now. <laughs>